righty then. So we thought we would have some fun today on the program by doing something that we did last month that got some nice feedback from some of our classic wrestling fans out there in the audience, and that's look at where I was at and what I was doing 40 years ago this month in uh, in my wrestling career because, well, now that we have got past my debut, I've got all the my books for the next... Um, what can we, we can do about another 10 or 12 years of this. Once a month, we, where was I 40 years ago? And it'll come out even. But you, Brian, kicking it up a notch, you said, well, why don't we not only look at that, but we've talked about that uh, Bill Watts came to Memphis to look at talent in the middle of November, and that's what led to the big trade between Jarrett and Watts and us going to Louisiana and some guys, Rick Rude, getting his first spot coming to Memphis. But we haven't, we've looked at and talked about how the Mid-South wrestling business was down, but we've not looked at the Memphis business and how Jarrett was trying to improve his business with the talent trade at the same time. So we thought we'd do both of those things here today. Is that correct? That is correct. And again, we've kind of talked previously about a lot of this period of time. We just recently talked about at least your birthday in 1983, and that right. led to a little bit of a bigger discussion, but this is going to be right after that, October. And again, a lot of the fans like to hear about this stuff because it was actually interesting instead of what we have to deal with today. But in Memphis in 1983, and, and again, the reason why that, not only because I was personally involved in this particular thing, but that we go back to Memphis a lot is because I can speak to that factually, not only from experience, but with documentation. Because I was either there or have the newspaper articles or things in my files. When the split happened, and we've talked about it in 1977 between Jarrett and Nick Goulas, it was such big news in Memphis that the, the newspaper, the Memphis Commercial Appeal, did major stories on the promotion and wrestling and wrestling in Memphis. And they got figures from the Mid-South Coliseum, a city owned building that couldn't be, I mean, down to the, to the cents on the money that wrestling took in and the rent that the Coliseum was paid by the wrestling promoters and et cetera. And the TV ratings, you, this was not a promoters, um, hyperbole or, press releases, this was actual legitimate figures. And you can kind of, <clears throat> you know, trace these things from that. And, and me not only documenting my payoffs, but also the houses and et cetera. So what had happened in Memphis in 1983, as we've talked about before, was that Jerry Lawler and Lance Russell had planned to split off and start running opposition to Jerry Jarrett in the spring of the year, stemming from Lawler being feeling misused or ill-used because Jarrett had just built that big 18,000-square-foot custom-made house on 100-something acres in Hendersonville, and Lawler was not a partner in the company, even though he was the star and, and had a piece of Memphis. So Lawler strong-armed his way into taking the book as a conciliatory measure for he and Lance not leaving Jarrett, which, as we've talked about, would have kind of doomed both of them in different ways. Hey, can I already stop you and ask a question? Yes. Because you were already working there, and you, of course, came in through Jerry Jarrett, although you always had a good relationship with Jerry Lawler. But before the housewarming party, what was the relationship like for the previous year between Dundee and Lawler? Um, because 82 the, is also the year where Dundee gets uh, his jaw broken by Randy Savage, so a lot going right. on. What was the relationship between the two of them like before Lawler forced Dundee out of being the booker? Well, I don't know that it was any different than it ever had been. And they had tons of respect for each other in the ring, and they could work together, and they had had the biggest money matches of modern day Memphis Lawler Dundee is bigger than Lawler Valiant Lawler LaDuke Lawler Idol Lawler anybody in the local fans memories because it did so well and they went back to it so many times and the matches were so good but outside the ring they were completely opposite people 
Dundee was a workaholic. He loved the booking. He loved going to the office, working with Jarrett and learning. Lawler would write the TV. <laughs> when he got to Channel 5 at 10 o'clock, we were going on the air live at 11. The, uh, Dundee was like most of the boys. He would stop at the liquor store and get a six-pack of beer on the way back or a 12-pack or whatever. Lawler would stop at McDonald's and eat a Big Mac. Um, Dundee dressed like Elvis, but Lawler did records like Elvis and wanted to be the king of Memphis. There was... There was enough about each other that were different that personally they could needle each other intentionally or unintentionally. And there was always competition because Lawler was the star and Dundee was never going to get over him. Dundee got over everybody else, so he but he was always going to be the the number two babyface unless he switched heel, in which case he could work with Lawler on top and be the number one heel, which they did at some points. And Dundee worked harder at the wrestling business, but Lawler was such a natural at it that it just rolled off of him. So they each had points where they were in the other guy's way. But Lawler wasn't trying to get even with Dundee. Lawler was trying to pull a power play on Jarrett, and Dundee just happened to be in the way. So that's how that happened. Lawler said, I'll be a partner and I'll be the booker because the reason why he had, I don't know that Lawler wanted to be the booker, but he had a whole crew of guys standing ready to come into his promotion that he had promised jobs to. And so he had to use all those guys. So it, that meant that if he wasn't open at his own office, he had to bring him into the existing one. And that meant all of Dundee's guys that he'd brought in as booker had to go which they remember the St. Valentine's Day massacre of my dynasty of champions was all in one night with the eight-man loser-leave-town match. But that's what, it, it wasn't him saying, I'll get you, Dundee. It was like, I'm going to get half of this company and I've got these guys that are my guys that I'm bringing in, so Dundee's got to go. But would he have been unhappy with Dundee's style of booking and what he was specifically booking in 1982 leading into this period of time? I mean, it was no consideration to, I'll be part owner now and you can just continue doing what you're doing. Well, no, because again, Lawler really, when Dundee was booking, Lawler booked whatever he was doing in Memphis anyway. And usually had pretty much input. That meant that whatever was going to go on in Louisville, Lexington, wherever was going to come off of that unless they couldn't get the big name to co to go to all those towns. So Dundee being the booker didn't hamper Lawler that much to begin with. It's just, you know, here we go. And that's why that they ended up switching Dundee heel at that point to work with Lawler on the way out. But before he worked with Lawler on the way out, he worked with all the other baby faces and had with Dutch and, you know, had several programs to get him ready as a heel for Lawler. And then they did the loser leave town, 11,000, whatever people, $46,000 complete sellout. And then Dundee's moved down to Georgia with all of us. If, if I could ask another question, it had been a long time since Dundee had been a heel and as a babyface, although popular, he may not have always been the greatest promo. Right. <laughs> were, you were you surprised how good he was as a heel in 1983? No. no, because that was the real Bill Dundee. He couldn't even be nice in a goddamn conversation. He could be funny, and he didn't have to be screaming at you and cussing you, but he was a natural heel. He was a natural smartass, a natural shit disturber. He had that impish twinkle in his eye when he did it sometimes, but he was a baby face because he was so cute. The girls loved him. But after a period of time, you know, when he get the, he had a bunch of baby faces for the girls, switched Dundee heel, and the real Bill Dundee comes out in the promos. And then you could believe him. And he was a great worker either way. So, and and he had come in as a heel with him and, and George Barnes, but Barnes did most of the talking back then. So Dundee had never really been the promo guy, but then that, that heel run in 83 
is what really kicked it. And he'd been in the territory eight years and was the number two guy already. Not doing really good promos. But that's the point is that once that Dundee's guys were moved out and Lawler was the booker, now Lawler's got to not only generate money, but prove himself a little bit. And Lawler had already got, had already been, had the deal for years where he would get 10% of the gate in Memphis for his match. So now he's the booker. So whatever decisions he makes about Memphis directly affects his payoff in a major way because Memphis is doing 20 grand every week. And Lawler and Bockwinkle could get it up to, in January, they did 32 grand. I mean, he was making $3,200 for that one match that one night. Now, in 1983, a dollar was worth, in today's money, according to the inflation calculator, about $3.09. So you're tripling every figure that I'm going to give from 1983. So if Lawler is making two and three thousand dollars every Monday night, fifty-two weeks a year, plus the rest of his wrestling pay, plus he owns half the fucking promotion, I think we've established again why he never left and went to other territories. But so, and he wasn't a big spender. And uh, no, not uh, you know. Well, he bought a Batmobile, but you know that was years later. But again, it wasn't later. like Ric Flair out there, you know, spending everything. No, he no, earned. no. And you know, never took a drug or drank a alcoholic drink in his life. And you know, he spent a lot of money on pussy, didn't we all? <laughs> Nevertheless, so where Dundee was different as a booker is Dundee worked more closely with Jared. He was more attuned to the bottom line. If you go back and look. Even in Memphis, which was the biggest cards, there were 20 guys on the card. Maybe there were six or seven, maybe eight matches. A couple of underneath local guys in Memphis to make it bigger. Louisville, Evansville, you'd get five, six matches. 16, 18 guys on the card. Now, whereas Dundee, in early 83, under his booking, except, like I said, for Lawler and Bockwinkle, they did 9,000 people one week. Dundee was doing between five and 7,000 people every week in Memphis. It wasn't horrible. It wasn't great. It wasn't record setting. wasn't about to go out of business. That was pretty good in the middle. But he was doing those five, six, 7,000 people crowds with 18 to 20 guys on the card. Lawler takes over the book. He gets rid of a lot of guys, but he also brings a lot of guys in. And as I've mentioned, Lawler... A lot of times wouldn't say no to guys that were asking for a job. He'd say, sure. And then he'd start booking them. And when he realized he had too many guys, he just wouldn't book you until you just left. And he, ah, oh, shit, I wish we could do better for you. And he'd somehow have no heat with people. So I, I wanted to read you this. Like I said, in March, they've got 18, 20 guys on the card. By the time Lawler, and we'll talk in a little bit more detail about who came in and what the booking was, but by the time that the Halloween show came around, the opening match was an eight-man tag. I was in it, and there were eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two. 33 guys on the card plus a couple of referees and Jimmy Hart was managing five of the matches. And it, it, Lawler's crowds after the summer, which was always the big period for Memphis, they had been above the five to seven. They'd been more like six to 8,000. You draw on an extra thousand or two people, you got 12 more guys on the card to pay. And then when it dropped, now you've got 32 guys on the card and you're drawing 4,000 people. So therein lay the problem. Lawler was a genius at booking himself and was pretty good at hot shotting for a little while, but he didn't, he didn't want to spend the time, nor was it his nature to really obsess over this shit. And he wasn't good with his fiscal conservatism on the bottom line of expenses versus revenue. So, once he took the book over, 
immediately, as I said, they switched Dundee heel and, and started getting that ready. First, Dundee worked with Dutch. But meanwhile, Lawler was bringing in names to work with him. April 25th, he brought Tully Blanchard in to work an international title match. Um, May 9th, and now the fabulous ones were here. This was the thing that was a little different about the last time Lawler had been sole booker. The fabs were still here. Stan Lane and Steve Kern. That was Jerry Jarrett's prize gimmick. So Jarrett still had a hand in the fabs. So he brought Fargo back. And Lawler's not going to say anything about that because Jackie Fargo was his mentor. But then whereas... Lawler was starting to work with some of the heels that Andy Kaufman would work with. The Fabs were working with the Moondogs, who were managed by Jimmy Hart. So Lawler was A-OK -okay with that as well. They brought Jackie Fargo in. They hurt Kern and had Stan and Jackie Fargo on top against the Moondogs and drew almost 8,000 people because Fargo hadn't wrestled there in years. What'd you think about it when the Moondogs hit Memphis? Because there was a WWF creation, that tag team, and then eventually Larry Latham got brought up and put into the group. But what did you think when they hit Memphis? Well, see, the thing is, nobody in Memphis had ever seen the Moondogs in the WWF because the there was right. no crossover of television and there was no home video really at that point. And Larry Latham had started out, he was from Arkansas, and he started out in Memphis and became one of the Blonde Bombers with Wayne Ferris, so we knew Larry. And Randy Colley was an old Southern guy and had been one of the assassins and blah, blah, blah. So, and they were perfect for Memphis with the chairs and the tables and the craziness. They didn't really, they didn't do the Moondogs in the WWF. They wouldn't have allowed that, that kind of insanity. But it was great for Memphis and with the Fabs and... Fargo then coming in and doing the furniture match and giving the moon dogs taste their own medicine. Those matches were insane. They were, they were drawing on the cards they were on equivalent to what Lawler was doing. And then Lawler brought Patera in and worked with Ken Patera. And then Austin Idol, because Lawler enjoyed, you know, working with Idol or having Idol as a, a baby face there. That's how you could tell that Lawler was doing his own thing without Jerry Jarrett's input, because Jerry Jarrett did not like Austin Idol. Well, yeah, because of the money and the issues, and you never knew what was going to happen, but Lawler, Austin Idol was another plowboy Frazier to Lawler. He's going to use him. And then they brought Stan Hansen in, and then the rib was that Lawler was working with Patera, who was easy, and they put Idol in with Stan Hansen. He was beating the shit out of Idol every night, and I was like, fuck! Lighten up, brother! But then again, you know what? Here, can I tell you something? Yeah. Years ago when I had the show Austin Idol Live with me and Austin Idol, it was a great show for 30 episodes and I'm still friends with Idol, but we had Stan Hansen on and Idol's like, oh, you know, Stan, do you remember Memphis? Do you remember working with me at Memphis? He's like, yeah, you got me fired. <laughs> <laughs> you said I hit you too hard. <laughs> But here, here's an example, July the 4th, 1983. I was down in Georgia. I wasn't, th I wasn't even there. But they had a big July 4th card at the Coliseum. But this is what Lawler booked that drew 8,774 people. Pretty good for a weekly town. But Ted Allen versus Ken Timms, Tommy Gilbert versus Galaxian One, Don Anderson versus Jimmy Kent, Dutch Mantell versus Duke Myers, Tom Pritchard and Lone Eagle, versus the giant rebel who was Plowboy Frazier and Little Tokyo in a mixed man and midget tag match. The Rock and Roll Express, Steve Regal, not William Regal, the one from Indiana, Spike Huber and Mad Dog Boyd against the Bruise Brothers, the Grappler and Man Mountain Link. Mad Dog Boyd against the Bruise Brothers? Mad Dog switched babyface when Dream Machine came in to take his place because Mad Dog was the shits in the ring. Yeah. But, but the boys liked him. So they replaced him it, teaming with Porkchop with Troy Graham, but Mad Dog for the Memphis end because he lived there. The people kind of liked him, so Lawler booked him as a babyface for a few weeks. That's when Bobby Eaton had to do the dog food match, where if Mad Dog beat him, he had to eat a can of dog food. 
and they put the goddamn beef stew with the dog food label, but it was cold beef stew, and Bobby had a touchy stomach, so he threw up anyway. But then continuing this card, Mid-America title, Stagger Lee, who was Coco Ware against Cowboy Frankie Lane, a cage match with the Fabs and Austin Idol against the Moondogs and Bobby Eaton, Jerry Lawler in a handicap match against Jimmy Hart and Andy Kaufman, and a 30-man battle royal for a 1984 Corvette that Lawler bought himself, so he won the battle royal. That drew almost 9,000 people, but the first five matches were immaterial to any goddamn thing. It was just too many people on the fucking cards, right? And by the end of the summer, when they had seen eight mans and ten mans and Jimmy Hart doing everything and Andy Kaufman managing every wrestler against Lawler and Ken Patera and the Assassins and Austin Idol, and then they brought Handsome Jimmy back. Because the six mans with Handsome Jimmy, oh, there was yeah. one... And by the way, that was in the middle of his hottest run in Mid-Atlantic. Yes, but they they had to, because again, Valiant could leave the Mid-Atlantic Territory and not go to Greenville, South Carolina on Monday night and come over to Memphis and they would sell out. And he'd make probably $1,500, which would be $4,500 today. Because they did two six-mans in a row, Lawler, Idol, and Jimmy Valiant against the Assassins and Ken Patera and sold out the first week and did almost 8000 the second week. And then I was back for this. This was the goddamnedest thing. The, um, oh, wait a minute. Here's another card. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten matches, six title matches, and one of the prelims was an eight-man tag. He just couldn't hold the cards down. And uh, then they brought in the uh, the San Diego Chicken because Lawler was a big baseball fan and he was the hot mascot at the time. The world famous Chicken. The world famous. Well, no, he was still a San Diego Chicken was back he? then. I thought. Hold on, let me remember the guy that. lost the rights to use that name. He had to call himself the no, world famous. No, the chicken. San Diego Chicken. He was still on October third, nineteen eighty three. Lawler with the San Diego Chicken against Jesse Ventura with Jimmy Hart for the Southern title, no time limit, no disqualification. And the deal was, if Ventura lost, he had to wear the chicken suit. Well, of course, not only did Ventura lose, but he's not going to wear the chicken suit. So they said, well, it won't fit Ventura, so Hart had to wear the chicken suit. And he wore it for a week in all the towns around Memphis because people would know, right? So that's when I had a team with him in Blytheville, Arkansas that night when he was wearing a chicken suit. Nevertheless, then the main event on October 17th was a 12-man hospital elimination tag team match. And it was the Assassins, who were Roger Smith and Donnie Bass, Buddy Landell, Dennis Condry, Norvell Austin, and Jesse Ventura against... The Fabulous Ones, Austin Idol, Jimmy Valiant, Jerry Lawler, and Rough House Fargo. And Brian, do you know what the rules of a hospital elimination match is? Uh, I do not, know. In Tennessee, a hospital elimination match was when a man is cut and bleeding, he is eliminated. And the last man not bleeding in the ring is the winner. Well, this was a 12-man. David had Rough House get juice. They had, a, they had like 10 or 11 of the guys get color, and this was on top. As a matter of fact, that was the main event the night that me and Hart had our match with Bobby where the fans hit the ring to retrieve the money that we talked about a week or two ago. So the point is, the cards were just huge. There was so many guys, and even if they were doing you know, six and 7,000, 8,000 people a week, it wasn't as profitable as it had been when they were doing five or six with the extra guys and things. And then he'd hot-shotted so much through the, through the year or through the summer, which was always the good time for Tennessee anyway, that by the time October and November rolled around, listen to these weeks. The 7,288 people was for one of the 
the second six-man tag, right? But then they were down to 39 46-05, 39-06, 38-00, 38-41. And that's when Watts showed up. For about six weeks or so, the, even Andy Kaufman wasn't new anymore. And the handicap boxing and wrestling match, Lawler versus Jimmy Hart and Andy Kaufman, 3,800 people. It, it The cards were huge. There were so many guys, and the, the money wasn't there at the houses. That's when, similarly... Watts, his business was down in Louisiana. And as promoters and their territories bordering each other, they started talking. Watts wanted talent. You could turn Memphis on a dime. As witnessed by that day in 1979, Fuller takes the crew back to Knoxville. They leave on a Thursday. Jarrett shoots an angle on a Friday, airs it on live TV on Saturday, main events with it on Monday night, and the following week it goes to the rest of the territory, and you've changed direction completely. Watts couldn't do that. He had multiple TV markets of similar size and importance, and the tape, as we've talked about, bicycled around. From the time that you shot the show in Shreveport until the time that it aired in its final markets out in Oklahoma City and Tulsa was five weeks. Watts needed a new booker. Watts needed talent that he could build over a period of a couple or three months and to re-rack his entire operation. Because of the way Memphis was laid out, what Jarrett needed to do was just get rid of all the extra guys that he didn't need or want and take a little bit more control of the, the booking of the cards and get Lawler one new money-drawn opponent. And he didn't even have to get him from Watts. He got Randy Savage. Because as we've talked about, when Dundee went to work for Watts, that opened the door for Savage to come work for Jarrett. And Watts had been building up Randy Savage on his TV, and then all of a sudden Bill Dundee was made the booker. Right. Randy Savage had to have somewhere to go. It, well, worked, it, worked, also, out, it worked out for everyone. It were, But also Watts saw that it was more important for him to have multiple talents that he could build around and a booker to implement what he wanted than just to have a talent like Randy Savage but not change anything else. So Watts ended up getting guys that he could draw money with with a push that hadn't been used in Memphis because there was too many guys, and Watts got a new booker with fresh finishes and Jarrett cut the fat off of his roster to make it more affordable going into the winter months and got one guy in Randy Savage that he could make dream matches with that had not been seen in his territory but had been being promoted for years. So that's why they did that switch. But as we've talked about, you know, Mid South being down until we all got there, Memphis again except for 8,000 people for the first Lawler and Savage match on December 5th, right after we had all left. Um, my God, well, there was 2,800 or 2,480 people there on December 19th, but that sounds like a weather-related issue because the next week was 6,450. So when you saw an outlier like that, but it was bad. And, and so... In the start of 1984, the Memphis crowds went up with Savage and that angle, and everybody was making more money on the cards because there were fewer guys. Jarrett had a bit more control over the book to get the stip sheared, stip sheared. Ship steered back in the right direction, and then Watts did what he did. When was the first time you heard any fear from any one of the crowds not coming back? Where? In which territory? In Memphis. Never. Because... It was always we could reheat this thing up. Well, I mean, in the 90s, yes. In the 90s, when I went back and made the shots with the Fabs, you know, or then later on, 
when we were working with them with Smoky Mountain, then that was a question, is it ever going to come back? And the answer was it kind of really didn't. But no, in think about this. Memphis, Tennessee, since it had been absorbed by Nick Goulas and Roy Welch in 1957 into their territory, had been the town. It took a little while. I mean, Sputnik kicked it off, and then they went through a little bit of a malaise. But then the Blue Infernos and the Fargos, and then Jarrett took the book over, and then they moved to the Coliseum. There had never been a period of time since the late 1950s where the wrestling business in Memphis wasn't mostly healthy and the ratings on TV were through the roof. It just, it never got bad and then got good again. It just kept getting better. And in the early eighties, there was no reason to think that anything was going to go wrong, which it didn't for a few more years. But then it, it had to do with Vince's expansion and the changes in the business rather than, anything to do with the actual product itself in Memphis. The product was pretty much still good until it couldn't be good anymore because guy Vince was snatching up the talent and things were constricting. But and then here's the thing. Let's talk about the Memphis economics for a second because a lot of people are going, well, you know, he talks about Memphis, but what about Louisville or Lexington or Nashville or Evansville, Indiana? The other towns were always good, but Memphis, as, as Christine Jarrett used to call it, was the magic town. That was, for Goulas and Welch, Nashville was never the main town. In the 40s it was, because that was the town they had. But Nashville never had a major building that could hold huge crowds. They did regular business for a long period of time. The Hippodrome... Who knows, could you get 2,500 to 4,000 people in there are estimates of ranges. It was a roller rink with bleachers. There was huge standing room. You could make it fit. Nobody knows how many people were in that fucking thing. But over 4,000 was a stretch in Nashville. And that was the same going through the 70s with the old fairgrounds building and then the new fairgrounds building topped out at a little over 2,000. But to play, unless they would go downtown to the auditorium in Nashville or back in the 50s go outdoors, they could draw 3,000 people every week, but it, there weren't big events. Chattanooga and Birmingham were Goulas and Welch's big towns in the 50s and early 60s, but then Memphis eclipsed it. And so now, as we would be in 1983, not only did Memphis do pretty much always a minimum of $20,000 at the gate every week, and that would be $60,000 today. But the ones where it didn't like at the end of the year, bad weather only did 3,000 people. Well, they also did sellouts that year where one house was $46,000, one was $32,000, one was some. So you were talking about easily grossing in 1983, especially that's when they moved up from Tickets being five, four, and three to six, five, and four. So your average ticket in the Mid South Coliseum in most of 1983 was just a skosh under five dollars. So if you did eleven thousand people, you did forty five, forty six thousand bucks, and that would triple to whatever that is three times in today's money. So you've got a million dollar town. You know when you Memphis is the big town in your territory. It's not the only one, but you know that you're going to gross somewhere around or north of a million dollars at the gate in that one town that year. That would be 3 million this year. Then you know that Channel 5 in Memphis because of the ridiculous ratings paid the company $1,500 a week to be allowed to air the television program. So that $75,000 becomes $225,000 in today's money that they were getting from a local television station for the right to air the program. 
To the best and, of your knowledge, how many stations actually paid the wrestling show in 1982-83? Other than Memphis. There, I don't want to say none, because I'm going to say if we, if we looked and narrowed it down, there was probably a couple of individual deals in different places, but it was not widespread or even common or even... It was a, a sweet fucking deal. It's what it was. Because, but because of the ratings. Because they couldn't put anything on their television show, even network programs that drew that many viewers. The advertising was sold out. People were writing in for tickets six months in advance. And they had a sweetheart deal at the Coliseum. Because in 1977, the Coliseum released the figures to the newspaper that their deal at that point, now this is an 11,000 seat building. This was before the pyramid. This was the building in town. But because wrestling had been such an integral part of the Coliseum, Lawler's mother worked as the ticket seller. Guy Coffey had been the manager of the Ellis Auditorium and kibitzed at the Coliseum. They had a good relationship with the manager. And they were tenants 52 times a year, meaning everybody that worked at the Coliseum got a, a payoff through the wrestling every week. They rented that building for $1,000 flat or 12.5% of the gate. So what's 12.5% of $20,000? 10% is two grand. So they were, they were renting an 11,000-seat building for a little over $2,000. And they're grossing 40 something thousand dollars. And the talent maybe is getting 30% of that, maybe. So it was a goddamn license to print money. They gross over a million dollars at the gate, three million in today's money. They get 200 and almost $50,000 a year in today's money as rights fee. And Channel 5 made the copies of the show for Louisville and Evansville and Lexington and all that other stuff. They got their production for free. They had a quality professional television program that not only they didn't spend any money on, but the television station paid them to shoot it. And they aired it in all their other towns. That's why Memphis was so important to that promotion. So that's what they had to do on occasion is they would re-rack things. If, if Lawler was being a little extravagant with the roster, they'd trim that down. Jarrett would come in, he'd trim it down. He'd make sure that things were on an even keel. He'd see that there was some progress, and he'd go away and do whatever the fuck else he was doing until something required his attention again. And every, every so often, you'd re-rack. Business ain't good. We're going to change shit. And they'd turn it on a dime. And a guy in a fucking opening match last week might be in a fucking main event. And it might work. That's the way that happened. When was Questions. The was there at any point here that you were personally worried about your job? From the time I started. <laughs> no, but, but specifically, like, it feels like there's some change happening. You can feel the winds of change. Yes. Well, no, see, when we came back from Georgia, and we talked about that with the deep dive on the Georgia summer of 83 debacle. But then I was going, and we talked about it in the September uh, deep dive we did. I'm on the B team. There's so many guys in the territory that they're running two towns every night, and I'm in, you know, fucking Osceola, Arkansas, instead of Louisville or whatever. And a lot of the other guys were too, and they were starving, but they didn't have any fucking place to go lined up. And the buttermilk run, as Dream Machine called it, and at that point, I'm like, I realized, well, here's the thing. I didn't think they would just say, you're fired, you're done, don't do this anymore. Because then Teeny would have been mad, bless her. And they had asked me, they kind of invited me. And I don't think any, nobody really wanted to fire me, but I was 50 bucks a night. So they're like, well, we'll put him in the spot shows. 50 bucks a night is all they had to pay me. If it drew more, they would. But we'll put him in the spot shows. We'll leave him off. We've only got one show. And maybe he'll quit on his own. And maybe he'll go back to taking pictures. We were making more money that way. But I wasn't going to quit. But at the same time, I realize I'm like, I'm 
I went to Lawler one time. I said, I feel absolutely useless. And he laughed. He, well, you know, we got to, you know, we'll rotate things around. And I asked him, I said, should I try to go somewhere? And he was like, well, if you, if you want to go ahead, you know, it's like, please let me help you pack your bag. But he wouldn't. So, and I talked to Ken Wayne because he had, was trying to get out and he had talked to Buck Robley in Kansas city. And that's, I've told you when Buck said, can he work? And Ken said, well, he can have manager matches. And Buck said, well, I can't pay anybody out here unless they can wrestle too. Cause he was making 300 bucks a week booking and wrestling Buck. So thankfully I didn't go there and three or four weeks later, there came Watts. And looking back on it in hindsight, as we've said, that's now why I realized Jerry Jarrett was there oversee, even though Lawler was the booker, Jerry came back in, oversaw all the finishes, gave everybody all the finishes, told them how to structure the match. Going back to like we used to, as he said, a long set of heat with a lot of hope spots, get the people hooked and involved. He was showcasing all of the guys he wanted to get rid of. Plus, he also wanted Watts to think that he paid attention to his business instead of just letting Lawler say, yeah, go eight minutes and do whatever you want to do. So Jarrett was there to implement that. And again, you know, within a couple weeks, then everything changed. And then I never... I never actually inquired to Buck. I asked uh, to Buck Robley. I asked Ken if he thought I should. And then after that didn't become necessary, then I began my string that continues to this day. I've never since asked to be booked anywhere by anybody or for a job from anyone in the wrestling business. They've always been offered. But yes, at one point I was like, well, sooner or later, they ain't going to let me do this anymore like this because this is the, just not important. Was there any grumbling from any of the veterans once you got back from Chattanooga or any of the other people there? I mean, were people already whispering like they're going to have to let some of us go at some point? Well, again, everybody kind of knew Lawler wouldn't really fire you. He'd just starve you out. Uh, but a lot of the guy, you know, poor Frank Morell. I mean, he had a house in Nashville. A lot of these guys had been around the territory, around that part of the country for a while, and things were just closing up where they couldn't go out and make a three-month run somewhere and come back and stay in their house. It was, and then, you know, it wasn't going to get any easier because 1984 was around the corner. So a lot of the guys, yeah, would love to have gone somewhere, but they didn't particularly have a place to go. But nobody was grumbling that, well, they ought to fucking fire those guys over there because everybody was kind of in the same boat. And it wasn't their fault that they were on the fucking card. The talent trade didn't just happen like that. It was kind of like a wave and then certain guys flowed in and out for a little bit. You know, Rick Rude was still there for a couple of months after you got there, for instance. Rick, well, R Rick Rude was actually, Rick Rude and Mike Jackson were the first tag team to ever face Dennis Condry and Bobby Eaton the Midnight Express. On Mid-South TV, and, yeah. And, and I believe we beat Rude just to show you where everybody was at at that point, because Mike Jackson was the veteran. And Rude was really skinny and he was wearing trunks, not pants, so you could see just how skinny he was. But do you think Jerry Jarrett was doing it more just to not get rid of, but to move this talent out? Do you think he really thought, okay, I could make something out of Rick Rude and Jim Neidhart and various other people? Was it just to have guys on the roster? Or did he know I could take anyone and just... And no, he saw, he knew that he could, he needed different faces. He got rid of some. He probably didn't get the quality of work from the people that he got than the people he got rid of, but they were new faces and he could Neidhart, you know, was, it was a guy you could do something with at that point because what a year later, he's in the WWF his heart foundation. Rick rude had a lot of potential. You could see that you could develop him as a guy that might draw money against Lawler in Memphis. Masao Ito. I don't know what, unless Jerry was just fantasizing about the glory days of Tojo, I don't know what he was thinking there. And Hacksaw Higgins, he just wanted a big guy. But also, those guys, Jared could bring them in, he could pay them 50 bucks a night, he could give them their notice in two weeks, he had no 
commitment whatsoever. Let's try it and see if it works. He he didn't marry him. He just borrowed him for a while. And you know, no and, one no one ever looks at it from this angle. But it was the best thing that could have happened to Rick Rude. Yeah, because he wouldn't have turned into ravishing Rick Rude probably if this chain of events hadn't happened. He would have still been working for Bill Watts, and who knows where he would have been sent, and who knows if someone would have said, "Let me turn this guy heel." Because he was awkward and he was green and he was inexperienced. But that was what Lawler specialized in. Give me a guy that looks good and I can have a match with him no matter what. And if it don't work, we cut it off and we change direction on a dime. And that's that's why I've, I've used Rick Rude as an example so many times. He was so green. Yes, Bill Watts loved real athletes and tough guys and probably would have taken an interest in Rick Rude but he wasn't going to move up on the cards there because he was so green and he'd had no experience and there was better talent. But when he went to Memphis, he's got the body, he's got the girlfriend valet, Lawler can cut some promos on him, let's teach him a few things, give him a fucking gimmick. Anybody got a robe? Here we go. And that's where you got a chance to try that shit. And then Rick Rude, R-O-O-D, became Rick Rude, R-U-D-E, and then he became ravishing, and then he had a girl, and then he learned how to swivel his hips. And then the goddamn fire department is bombing me right now. If you hear those, are these going to be the sirens that you can't hear? Well, I heard them. I was all right. And, but and, and in a smaller territory like that, that's where a guy gets a break. And if he's any good at all at this, then maybe the next tour territory will take him, which they did. Was the next place? Did he go to Florida? Work with Percy Pringle as Rick Rude from then on? After that, I think. And that was another place. He went place to Florida, to and then he went to Texas. Yeah, but I'm saying he went to Florida after after Memphis, but he already had the gimmick now. He wasn't a job guy coming in, right? you know, with a brand new name and everything. Now he'd kind of worked on it a little bit. Then he went to Texas, and by then he was the fucking champion, world-class champion two years later. Right, and then he went from there to the NWA where he gets a nice push as tag team with Manny Fernandez. They get the world yep. tag titles, and... They take the belts, <laughs> literally, <laughs> take the belts with them, my goddamn Mokovich belts, and then he's in the WWF four years later, but it was like four years of college for Rick Rude, and it started with Jerry Jarrett saying... Like the way he looks, let's give him a gimmick. Well, that's the other thing. If you look at just Rick Rude's first four years, and it's not exclusive to him, it's most people from that era, I would think. But just looking at where he worked and when he worked there, in four years, did he work a thousand matches? I mean, how he worked a lot in oh, four yeah. years. How many matches does a guy work nowadays if he starts in his first four years? Yeah, no, a thousand matches in four years at that point would have been he would have had to be injured for long periods of time to not have had any more matches than that. That'd only be 250 a year. That would be way low. But anyway, that's the, that's the economics of a territory like that. And the promoters didn't go to try to sell out the biggest building in town for the biggest show ever, and then start over from scratch again. They built it to where they did steady business for years and years and years. And the Tennessee Territory was an example of that in that wrestling never died in Nashville. It was more popular at some times and less popular at other times. At one point in the 60s, Nick was running twice a week, Wednesdays and Saturdays, because he didn't have a big enough building, so he just ran more shows. And Chattanooga for 30 years was was regular birmingham was as i said the big town 50s and 60s petered out because it ended up running on the same nights as as memphis monday nights and nick's in didn't do as good as jarrett's did after he took over but it was all about small cards personal issues main events that drew everybody being figured in in some degree so that they could be moved in different places up and down on the cards and repetition every week, get those 3000 people to buy a ticket for $5. And at the end of the year, you've sold 150 or 200,000 and you've grossed a half million dollars in some of the B towns. 
the financial realities probably answer the question for me. But in the spring of 85, when Jimmy Hart leaves for the WWF. Yes. And you're in Dallas, not very happy. And you're looking to go to World Club. Uh, you're looking to go to Mid-Atlantic, I should say, or Crockett for, again, financial conditions, good money. <laughs> Any thought at all about calling up and saying, hey, I know Jimmy Hart's gone, but I can come home. I hate Dallas. Well, no, I, I didn't hate Dallas. It was a, We had fun at various points, especially working with the Fantastics, and it was $1,000 a week, which would be three grand now, so that was like paid vacation money. Uh, we weren't being used properly, but there was never the thought of that because since we had been going to, we had already been asked by Dusty and Flair and already made a deal with Crockett and then changed that to go to Dallas because Watts wanted us to. We already knew as soon as we left Dallas, whenever that was, we were going, because they'd said it's a standing offer. When you get finished out there, give us a call. So it wasn't like we were wondering where we were going to go from there, we were like, how long are we going to be here in Dallas before we go to work for Jimmy Crockett? So, no, I never... You know, I was keeping up with videotapes and the happenings in the territories, but I looked at it as more like, oh, Jimmy's gone to New York. It won't be the same in Memphis. But I wasn't like, I need to go back and replace him because I would have shot myself in the fucking foot. I may have been a better manager than in 85 than when I left in 83. But I wouldn't have been making nearly as much money as I would have been making in Memphis plus, or in uh, the Carolinas. Plus the boys would have said, what are you crazy? Jimmy Crockett wants to make us the world tag team champions. You want to go back to Memphis? So no. I say no. <laughs> All right, you say no, and this is your show, and that was a fascinating look at October well, 1983. Well, no, let's look at October now, my October, real quickly, because there's still, there's a couple of things in here that you can learn about the wrestling business, what I'm going to say. Again, in on October 1st, 1983, we're six weeks from Bill Watts coming to Memphis and look at the talent and me finding out that I'm going to get a new job. And I am the the cohort of Jimmy Hart in the first family. Lawler's just decided every heel is managed by Jimmy Hart. They're all in the first family. But Hart can't be in two towns at the same time. So Jimmy Cornette is going to be his assistant first family manager. And I'm going to go to all the fucking tank towns and, and uh, do that. Jimmy Hart will manage all the other heels, including the other heel manager. Yes, I was in the group of the other heel manager, but we were all part of the first family. And and that's like I said, Dundee had used just to be different. He knew Lawler was going to be the one to finally beat Jimmy Hart up, but he could be the one to beat me up. And so anyway, but on October first, I was in Ripley, Tennessee, which was three hundred and fifty miles round trip from Nashville. I spent twenty seven dollars on gas and four dollars on food because you know what the price of a Wendy's triple combo was in October nineteen eighty three. No, how much? Four dollars. <laughs> really, in nineteen eighty three? Yes, it was. Wow. And uh, it may have been some sense involved in that. But again, it's a spot show because they're running two towns almost every night because of all the people. They can't put 40 guys on a card in Louisville, right? Jarrett would have had a conniption fit. So I managed the Russian invader who was Jerry Novak, formerly of the Bounty Hunters. I believe I mentioned he was from Lithuania or wherever. He could speak Russian, but he wasn't Russian. But under the mask, he was Russian. And he beat the Jaguar, who was Danny Davis. And then I managed the Prince of Darkness and Lucifer, who were Duke Myers and Frank Morrell under Lawler's horror movie mass against the Rock and Roll Express, who won. Then me and Jimmy Hart, because Ripley was close to Memphis for the Saturday night, me and Jimmy Hart uh, got beat by Terry Taylor in a handicap match. And then I was eliminated in the Battle Royal. So it was a light night. I only worked four matches. And got $100. And we we started this discussion when we talked about September, but to me, this was... 
it, it was excruciating at the time because I'm like, oh shit, I got to rush and go out there and I've come back and I'm blowed up and I got to go out again. And the boys loved to fuck with me. They saw me looking like I had a bucket of water turned over my head. Hurry, Jim, hurry. They're about to ring the bell. But they, I realized now it was so much practice. It was so much experience. And not only that, but if I was fucking up, they would. I don't care if I was cheap or not. They wouldn't have had me going out seven times a night, right? If I was fucking anything up. And I can look back at that now, having run shows and been responsible for. Yeah, I like his shit. Send him out there, have him do some more shit. It was easier for the guys because we're on these small shows, small crowds for the most part. They don't want to work hard and take bumps. But now it's not like. It's not like having Jim Cornette at that point in time for a manager meant they got extra heat because I was a big managing star. It wasn't like, oh, this is going to make it if Cornette goes out with me. It was like, if I've got this fucking guy, this manager, he's on TV, they know who he is, he's annoying, but he knows if I'm a pretty boy heel, Cornette knows how to help me fold my robe and brush my hair and milk the people how good looking I am. If I'm a monster heel, Cornette knows I need to be held back and put over and made afraid, you know, people afraid of me. The baby face knew that I knew all the spots that were going to come up. That if I see Bill Dundee grab a headlock and get shot off near my ropes and he hits the far ropes and there's another drop down, he's going to dive out and chase me. When he does, I'm already halfway around the ring post so I can roll in, have a double knockout with the goddamn heel. I knew the spots. I knew wrestling. I could hand the gimmicks in. I could use it, whether it was a real foreign object that the heel was milking to get heat or whether it was a donut hole that didn't even exist. I could do that. I knew if the heel rolled out and hugged me in a conference that the baby face was going to reach out and run our heads together and all the kids in the crowd were going to fucking cheer. I, I could take the bumps and leave myself open to shit. So that's why the guys wanted me to go out on these small shows. If I'm out there being made a fool of, the heel manager, they got to take fewer bumps. So they learned that I learned to work all the spots with all these guys to stretch and stall for time and reduce the punishment on everybody's body, except for mine. But it was experience. So then Sunday, October 2nd, was a day off, because with most of the time we were off on Sunday, unless we were in Jackson, Tennessee, which I was not. On Monday, October 3rd, I will have you know that while most of the people were down in Memphis, Tennessee, enjoying the big show of the week, I was in Mount Washington, Kentucky, which is literally down the road from Louisville, but I lived in Nashville on a $1,700 house, and I got paid 50 bucks. Now, bear in mind, I got 100 for Ripley, because that was a halfway decent house. But $1,700, even tripled, that meant it was a $5,100 house. In today's money, $50. For that, I managed Alpha the Galaxian in a losing effort against Tom Pritchard. I managed Carl Fergie in a losing effort against Tommy Rogers. I managed Lucifer and the Prince of Darkness in a losing effort against Bobby Fulton and Terry Taylor. I managed uh, Buddy Landell in a losing effort over Bill Dundee, and I got eliminated in the Battle Royal. Five matches that night. The next night in Waynesboro, Tennessee, in front of a $2,200 house, I got another 50 bucks. Same thing. Rock and Roll beat the Prince of Darkness and Lucifer. Dundee beat the Russian. Dutch Mantell and Coco beat the Bruise Brothers. And then Dundee came back and worked twice and beat Buddy Landell. And I got eliminated in a battle royal. The figures you're using, what are the sources of, uh, what's the source of these financial figures and were you already asking these questions back then or writing them down yes because that was the big question and i've said this before the guys whenever you work to show you when you came in what's the you asked the promoter whoever the local promoter was whoever was checking up at the box office whoever was responsible 
What's the advance look like? And either, oh, it's good, or, oh, it's up from last time, or, oh, it's not too good, or, oh, frankly, it's the shits, Jim, or whatever you got. (laughs) But then at the end of the night, and this was something that I saw the top guys doing, and I picked up on it. Only I carried it as I usually do to the extremes. You know, when guys were on a big house in Memphis or Louisville did like 5,000 people, hey, what was the house? 27 grand or whatever. Oh, great. Well, I started asking. And to be honest, even Buddy Wayne, who a lot of these $2,200 houses were Buddy Wayne towns, or Eddie Marlin or whoever the promoter was, I asked Teeny in Louisville and Evansville. And we'd ask guys, coffee in Memphis because he was the one checking up but I started recording good bad and indifferent because I wanted to know I want to know what the house was and what I got paid and the next time we ever came back there is it up or down and what was different so I started recording these things and honestly in some cases uh, some of these spot shows whoever was running didn't really want to admit it but I think they admired my fucking interest in in the business end of the business and so they were legitimate figures. You didn't. You never asked how many people were here. You asked, what, what was the house? That's how you got paid. What was the money? If five people bought five $500 tickets, that was the same thing as 500 people buying five $505 tickets. It didn't matter. But anyway, on October 5th, I was supposed to be in Forest City, Arkansas. But I was off because I couldn't afford to make the fucking drive by myself and everybody else was down there. And I was off on Thursday the 6th as well. But back in action on Friday, October 7th in Blytheville, Arkansas at the American Legion Arena where the house was $2,400 and I got another 50 bucks. Coco Ware beat me and Jimmy Hart. The Fabs beat the Assassins and I got eliminated in a battle royal. And then, of course, we went to Memphis uh, that night because the the town the next night was right outside of Memphis, but that's a a week I wasn't even on television. They didn't have me go to TV. I just went to my cousin Larry's and slept late. But on the 8th Saturday night, I was in Obion, Tennessee for an $1,800 house for another $50. Listen to this one. The Russian invader got to beat Terry Taylor, by God. And then the Rock and Roll Express beat me and Lucifer because Duke was hurt. So they had me wrestle as Frank Morell's tag team partner. So I can say that I've been tombstoned by The Undertaker, figure forward by Ric Flair, pile driven by Jerry Lawler, and was Frank Morell's tag team partner. And then Dennis Condry and Norvell Austin beat Coco Ware and Dutch Mantell. Dundee beat Buddy Landell by DQ, and I got eliminated in a battle royal. Now, that week, I made $200 for working one, two, three, four days, and that would be $600 today, and it'd still be the shits, wouldn't it? Yeah. I never even heard of that town before. Obion, Tennessee? Obion, where's that? It's down the road from Webb City. You know where that is, don't you? No way. Halfway up a spider's ass. So uh, Sunday, October 9th, I was off. Now, the following week, things were looking up. Listen to this. On Monday, wait a minute. Let me just hold on here. On October 10th, 1983, on a Monday night, were, was Memphis running? Of course it was. Memphis had Austin Idol versus Stan Hansen in a bunkhouse match. Jerry Lawler versus Jesse Ventura for the Southern title. The Bruise Brothers versus the Rock and Roll Express. Buddy Landell versus Dutch Mantell, Tommy Rogers versus Coco Ware, and more. I was in Scottsville, Kentucky. $1,800 house. The payoff was $55. They took pity. Bobby Eaton beat Carl Fergie. And then Terry Taylor and Bobby Fulton beat Carl Fergie and Lucifer. The, they sent the Fabs to Scottsville. This may have been the start of some issues with the Fabs and Lawler. Fabs over the Assassins, Dundee over Landell, and me eliminated in a battle royal. 
And then since I was in Kentucky, I actually got to go to Louisville the next night. And then Louisville had an $8,900 house. So <laughs> all summer, Louisville had been fucking cooking. And now just like Memphis, it's starting to droop because it'd been hot shotted and hot shotted. So I get to go back to Louisville. The house isn't $9,000. At the ticket prices of that time period, that meant there was right around 2,000 people there, which was abysmal at that point in time. But I got $90. Dennis Condry and Norvell Austin had a no contest with the Rock and Roll Express. Shades of things to possibly come. Dundee beat me and Jimmy Hart in a handicap match, and the Fabulous Ones beat the Assassins. I splurged that day. I spent $7 on food. No hotel because I was home. What'd you buy? What was the food? Uh, well, I can't remember. I didn't write specifically. How would what I know that you wouldn't have that? Was. Seems like the kind of thing you'd keep track of. Probably went to Kingfish. Anyway, on in, on October twelfth, we went to Evansville, Indiana. The house was not recorded. I I got fifty dollars. I have a feeling it was one of those nights. I didn't want to disturb Christine. Terry Taylor was injured, so me and Jimmy Hart won our handicap match by default because they said, fuck it, this house, we're not even going to do that match. Dundee beat Jesse Ventura by disqualification. That's where I'm, That's the first time I managed Jesse Ventura because Hart was down at the other end. No, Hart was on the card. Then why didn't he go out with Jesse? I bet, you know what? It's a great story. Yeah, a great story, lady. <laughs> I managed Jesse Ventura. I know that much because I wrote it down. Jimmy Hart, I bet, was doing a deal with Lawler. And since we didn't have the handicap match, he saved him for that. And the Fabs beat the Assassins. And then we were in Bardstown, Kentucky on October 13th. $4,100 house. I got $65. Again, the Russian Invader won. He beat Bobby Fulton. Buddy Landell beat Tom Pritchard by DQ. Coco Ware beat me and Jimmy Hart. Coco Ware and Dutch Mantell beat the Russian and Lucifer. And I got eliminated in the Battle Royal. But this is a, it's a great week because now I've already worked four times. I got two more coming up. Boonville, Mississippi on the 14th and Nashville on the 15th. Go ahead. Did you enjoy doing Battle Royals? Oh, fuck no. Because, again, I, I still didn't really know what I was doing to, to do anything in the ring. And it got crowded. And generally what I would do on these spot shows, and the boys liked it because they'd get a bigger pop at the end, I would come out for the Battle Royal and slide under the ring where the referee wouldn't see me. And then they'd start the match, and while the Battle Royal was going on, I would crawl to the west side, then to the east side, then the north side, and I would peek out from under the apron skirt and make sure everybody saw that I was there and looked like I was scared. And then all the people were screaming, he's under the ring, he's out to get that son of a bitch, he's out of the ring. And the referee would be oblivious until the ring cleared out a little bit. And then when there was a baby face and a heel or a couple of baby face and a couple of heels, I'd come out get somebody from behind, the heels would take over, and then the baby faces would make their comeback and either eliminate me and then the real heels, the real wrestlers, or save me for last and dump me for the big pop because they finally got the fucking weasel that was trying to get out of this because he was scared. Nobody told us to do that. In those days, the on a spot show, the instruction was, Battle Royal, Brian goes over, give us 10 minutes. He just figured the shit out. So that's what we usually did. As long as we know who's going over, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, in Boonville, Mississippi, Jerry Lawler went over me and Jimmy Hart. The fabulous ones went over the assassins, and I was out in the Battle Royal. And Lawler and Hart were in Boonville because it's right down the road from fucking Memphis. But we had earlier in the year, I believe I've I've mentioned it, We've done a $10,000 house in Boonville. This is not recorded, but it was a $65 payoff. So I'm pretty sure 
that it wasn't no 10 grand. And then I wasn't on Memphis TV again, but I was back in Nashville on Saturday night, $5,900 house, $70 payoff. Listen to this match. Dennis Condry, Norvell Austin, and Buddy Landell, no contest. Ricky and Robert Gibson and Ricky Morton. Oh, wow. The Gibson brothers and the Rock and Roll Express in the same match against Dennis Condry, Buddy Landell, and Norvell Austin. That one was fun. And then Dundee beat me in heart. That was when I go out there and start cutting a promo about how Jimmy Hart is injured and can't be there that night. And since it's a handicap match and I don't have a partner, well, Dundee, you're just out of luck. We're going to have to call this whole thing off. And then Dundee jerks me in over the top rope and starts beating the shit out of me saying, fuck you, we're calling it off. And while he's beating me up, Jimmy with a baseball cap and a jumpsuit and a whole tray of popcorn things comes out and is trying to sneak up behind Dundee. But as he rolls in the ring, he's still got the tray of popcorns. Dundee turns around and draws back and he throws the popcorn up in the fucking air and, and Dundee nails Jimmy and Jimmy takes the bump and the popcorn comes right down on his fucking face. It was hilarious. That was Nashville. And then I was off again. And then, believe it or not, October 17th, we talked about it before. I'm back in Memphis. Oh, and by the way, I made $395 that week for work in six days. So if you triple that, I actually made $1,200, and I only had to work about 24 matches to do it. Is your mom asking you at all when she talks to you about how you're doing financially, and you think she's worried at all about what your future will be? Hey, well, yeah, well, she was like, Jimmy, you're not in Louisville. Well, I had to be down in Obion, Tennessee, Mom. Yeah, no, not making a lot of money here. I'm sure she was worried, but at the same point, it, was, it wasn't It was like I was, if I had gone to Louisiana and called home and said I'm making 300 bucks a week, she'd have been like, get your ass back here. But it was like she knew where I was. I lived in Nashville, but I'm seeing her a couple times a month. And at least it was a you know a friendly atmosphere, but I'm I, she probably had some second thoughts about how this was going to work out toward the fall of '83. Yes, but on the 17th, that was the night Bobby Eaton lost to me and Jimmy Hart. The money deal. The house was twenty nine thousand dollars, and I made two hundred bucks. And I'm thinking, wow, this is going to be a goddamn great week, right? And I was in Louisville the next night and got $100 for a handicap match with Bobby and managing the Gibson, Morton, Condry, and them six-man. There's another $100. I'm like, wow, this is great. And then I was supposed to be in Evansville and Columbia, Kentucky, and it's scratched out off. I'm pretty sure that's when I got so bad fucking sick I couldn't make Evansville and Columbia because I couldn't breathe through five matches per night with goddamn bronchitis. So I picked up on Friday the 21st in Pickwick, Tennessee, where the house was $2,650. I got 60 bucks. I only had to work twice, one handicap match. And then in Bowling Green, Kentucky on the 22nd, where the house was $3,800, I got 60. I only had to work three times. So Memphis saved me. I made 420 bucks that week, only working four times. And we're coming down to the nub of things. Monday the 24th was off, as was Sunday the 23rd. No way they're going to let me go to Memphis. I might make a payoff. I was in Stanford, Kentucky on the 25th for 125 bucks. I was in Nashville on a Wednesday night show, which never drew in those days. For $50. And by the way, listen to this one. Bobby Fulton in a draw with Alpha the Galaxian. Pritchard over Lucifer. Rogers over Fergie. The Moondogs over Bobby Eaton and the Jaguar. And the Fabs over the Assassins. That was the entire... I was literally out there for the entire fucking card. And then in Cave City, Kentucky... Same thing, five matches for $50 the next night. Same thing, the 28th, five matches. No, 
One, two, three, only four matches in Springfield, Tennessee for $50. Then we left Springfield, and I remember this. I rode with Frank Morrell, and uh, God dang it, who else was with us? It, may, it was Jerry Novak, because we had to be in Springfield, Tennessee, which is northwest of Nashville, and we left there at, God damn it, 10.30 at night, let's say, and had to go 240 miles to Memphis for Memphis TV. Did that, which was for free, by the way, and then turned around and came all the way back to Nashville, where we were in Nashville on Saturday night, 30 miles away from the show in Springfield we'd done Friday night. So we did a 400-something, 500-mile round trip to go do a free TV taping. And then in Nashville... Bobby Fulton beat Alpha. I managed Pork Chop Cash. He beat Brock Woods. Lucifer was defeated by Bobby Eaton. The Russian invader drew Dutch Mantel. The Bruise Brothers beat Charles Atlas and James Daniels. Charles Atlas? Exactly. A black guy came into the territory, called himself Charles Atlas, and they tried to tell people he was Tony's brother. Oh, God. <laughs> See, I don't even remember that. Yeah, it didn't last long. <laughs> And Coco Ware over Tommy Rogers by DQ and Lawler and Dundee over the Moondogs. I'm one, two, three, four, five, six, seven matches in Nashville. And then I was off on the 30th and I was back in Memphis on the 31st, that famous Halloween night where not only did the fucking card tank, it only did like 14 grand. I made $75, but I was in the opening eight man tag Bobby Eaton, the Jaguar, Bobby Fulton, and James Daniels beat me, Lucifer, the Russian, and Carl Fergie. And that was, I, again, I got to work with so many different guys. I managed Ken Patera. I managed Jesse Ventura. I was, you know, involved with all of these top guys. They were all giving me all of their various moves and shit. It was like going to wrestling school, I guess. But, um... Even 40 years ago, it was hard to live on $250 to $300 a week when you were going somewhere six days out of that week, oftentimes, and working 30 to 35 times. For working that schedule and making that kind of money, was it hard to convince, I guess Watts would have been one, was it hard for Watts to convince Carl Fergie to get out of the ring the next year? <laughs> Carl Fergie would have kept that referee job in Mid-South until the end of his life if he'd had a choice. Because that's the thing. The first check we got from Bill Watts for doing preliminary matches on the cards when we first started in the territory was the biggest check I'd ever gotten in the wrestling business. For being in prelims, the biggest payoff that I'd gotten to that point was $300 for being in the semi-final match of that Lawler Dundee loser leave town match in the summer. My biggest week had been, I think $800. Now, of course, $2,400 in today's money, not bad for a rookie, but that then suddenly, you know, the, for our first check for Watts is almost $1,100 for prelim matches. And then the following two weeks, uh, we didn't, by payoffs, we didn't make $1,000. But Watts had promised us, assured us, that we would make at least $1,000 a week. So he bonused us so we would. And, you know... It, it was with, a $200 bonus. I like your haircut. I mean, what kind of bonus was it? Well, that that's the thing. It was... It, 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 Watts would bonus guys probably what they should have been paid to begin with. But because it was clearly defined as here's your payoff and here's a bonus, you felt good about it. But if you had a good match, you saw on your check, plus whatever. Or if you did something to distinguish yourself, you, you know, got there despite all obstacles of you making the town. Or, you know, you made the finish even better or it was something he wanted to show on TV and it was so good whatever in his mind you deserved a little plus, he would plus you. Or just if he was making up a verbal agreement. 
It's the only uh, – Crockett just gave us payoffs, good payoffs, but he never bonused us or plussed us. Watts would plus you because it was an incentive. You want to see a lot of pluses. Did you get a bonus, a plus, when you lost your hair? I did not. So there, because was, it, there was no incentive. It didn't, it didn't <laughs> fucking draw as well as they thought it would, so he didn't feel bonusy. But but I did get, you know, I got I got a bonus, as I recall, when I goddamn came back early from goddamn mono so I could make the show. You know, whatever. But but that's it. You talked about Fergie. The referee checks when we were hot in Mid-South were the equivalent to what the top heel in Memphis was making. Wow, really? The opening match, guys... In and because we talked to him, because we knew some of Jerry Gray, Pat Rose, the guys in the opening match in Mid South when we were doing that business were making eight hundred to a thousand dollars a week, and that would be what twenty five hundred, three thousand dollars in today's money to jerk the curtain. So, yeah, no, you would. It, Carl Fergie was happier being a referee, and making a thousand dollars than being a wrestler in Tennessee, making 400 with where the spot he'd have been on the card. All right. Well, there you go. But I mean, that that's a thing. And again, you know, that was a, like the opening match guys making a thousand dollars a week, but that was for a three month run and it wasn't every week. And it was, you know, but, but that was better than they were going to do in other places. And that's why you wanted to be on the card in a hot territory. And Watts was very fiscally conservative too. You know, he built the package shows like Eddie Graham did seven big matches, 18 stars, two titles on the line. That was, that's what I'm saying. 18 guys on a card, seven big matches, two championships at stake. You know, prices raised for this major event. He wouldn't have 40 guys on a fucking card in a Superdome. Because at, at some point, if you've got 40 guys on your card, regardless of who they are, good, bad, or indifferent, only 10 or 12 of them were in whatever matches that drew the money. And then you're just paying guys to, you know, indulge their goddamn, you know, enjoyment of being on your card because they didn't contribute anything not because they didn't work hard or they're not a name, but because they're not at a feature match. You can't be that deep with a wrestling card and everybody means something. So, and, and then Watts had the thing in 84 that they were never able to do in the Tennessee territory of raising prices indiscriminately depending on the size of the card and the attraction at the top. And I mean, we were in towns in just one year in Louisiana that it had four or five sets of ticket prices. The last stampede, he jacked everything. A place that had $8 ringside for a regular show would be $15 ringside. But they were paying it. So he did all kinds of unusual things that he could get by with in that territory, and he really, because of the geographic area and the fact that he had cobbled it together from the Louisiana Territory, McGurk's Oklahoma Territory, Paul Bosch's Houston. You could do different things in different towns. You could jack the prices up in the Sam Houston Coliseum for the last stampede or scaffold match or Ric Flair and Kerry or whatever. And it's Houston, Texas. They'll pay it. But you got to run the same fucking attractions in Jackson, Mississippi for half the price, $8, maybe $10 ringside because it's fucking Mississippi. But he was able to do that all over the place and gross well over a million dollars just in a five or six week period in that territory because he played with the ticket prices and he was also fiscally conservative with the number of guys that were on the card. So everybody could make a decent payoff. Because they're splitting the same amount of money up between 20 guys is 40 guys. It's not like the promoter's saying, I got 40 guys, I got to pay them a bunch more money. Stars get the same thing and everybody else gets half as much. Another case of there you go.